Hi friends, I'm Gio, and I write gay fiction. It's my hobby. This is a story called Shy. Wednesday morning, I reread the email of my work schedule for the Bernini Casino. Weeks ago, I had arranged to have this weekend free so I could work on the final paper for economics. My boss had changed my schedule. I now worked Saturday night. Though my boss had apologized and given me the following weekend off, it was all hands on deck this Saturday. Huge college party. Technically, it would be overtime, and I could use the money. And I still had Sunday to work on the paper. I texted back that I would be there. Sighing, I looked around. Oliver Landau sat by the floor-length windows at the side of the dining hall, alone. His basketball buddies and the cheerleaders that always shadowed him were absent. How I wished I could get to know him. He had black hair styled all casual, warm brown eyes, a genuine smile for anyone who spoke to him, and a cute little dimple on his right cheek. He was a classic extrovert. Everybody liked him, and he got along with everybody. Oliver was also the captain of the basketball team though the season had ended a week ago. A senior, popular, athletic, strikingly handsome, smart, he was a pre-law major. No matter what he wore, he wore it sharp and crisp, and it followed the curves of every muscle. Today, he wore a pale yellow button-down shirt and dark khaki shorts. We shared Economics 101 together an auditorium-style class with at least a hundred students each session. I always sat in the back, that is, until I saw him. I moved up to the middle of the classroom trying to build up the courage to talk to him. Oliver always sat near the front, surrounded by all the cool kids. Me? I'm Gregory Williams. Shy is the nice way of putting it. Social phobic introvert is the clinical diagnosis. I'm a psych major and perpetual wallflower. I wore a blue and purple wrinkled tie-dyed tee and an oversized dark gray hoodie even though Vegas can get hot. I kept the hood up. Like almost every day of my life, I let my long brown hair hide my face from the world. I played with the rainbow crystal around my neck. It's organite, and it's supposed to help me not to be anxious or tense or afraid. It hung on a long stainless steel chain outside my t-shirt. A birthday gift from my Aunt Steph and Uncle Edmund. Aunt Steph made it, so it's one of a kind. Steph and my mom are way into crystals. I don't see my Aunt Steph too often. Her house is on the East Coast, quite a ways outside of town, somewhere in the woods. It's also a crystal museum. Today, Oliver sat alone. I took a deep breath and called my best friend. My cousin, Jack. He also lived on the East Coast, and I haven't seen him for almost a year. Man, I can hear your heartbeat through the phone. Is it that guy you like again? Jack said. Nobody's around him. What do I do? I whispered. Go talk to him. There are plenty of things scarier than having a little conversation, Jack said. How? He doesn't know me. I can't go up to a complete stranger and say hi. At least not without an excuse. I said. You need an excuse, Jack said. Men can be so dense. Give me the phone, a woman said. That would be Miranda. Jack's live in. Gregory, buy him a coffee. What about the scar? I started to say. No arguing. Do it, and we'll expect to report in an hour, Miranda said. Get Oliver a coffee. I can do that. I rubbed the crystal, hoping it was working. I ignored my fear and went into the cafeteria. Payday was tomorrow, which meant I didn't have a lot of money today. I bought two small coffees, one for me and one for him, then took a couple of creamer packs and some sugar over to Oliver's table. He was reading our economic text. I turned my face to show the right side, not the left. Please, God, don't let him see the ugliness. What do I say? The most unoriginal line ever. Hi, would you like some coffee? I said, trying to act casual while I set one of the cups by him. My heart had never beat so fast in my life. 
Oliver looked up, his eyes flickering on the scar on the left side of my face. My hair never seemed to hide it completely. Everybody's eyes looked at the scar when they met me, and out of reflex, I covered it with my hand. Most people judged me because of it, and the kids back in school weren't very kind about it. Oliver placed a pen in his book and closed the book. I'd love some coffee. Hi yourself, he said. I don't think he recognized me. I set the creamers and the sugars by the coffee and took a seat opposite him. I was too nervous to even smile. We have a class together. Economics. I'm Gregory. A major psych. I mean, a psych major. I know you. You're the guy that sits a couple of rows behind us, Oliver said, sipping his coffee. He didn't add creamer or sugar. I added one sugar to mine, hoping my hand didn't shake. God, I was so nervous. That's me. What did you think about the final paper our professor assigned? I've tried hard not to think about the paper. I've been so busy with basketball, I haven't done a thing, Oliver said, and gave me his warm smile. Something inside me sighed and melted and momentarily dreamed that there could be in us. What universe am I living in? Maybe we could work on it. I mean the paper, together, and we could meet at the library sometime and, um, work on it, I asked, playing with the rainbow crystal. My legs shook a little. I hoped Aunt Steph was right because I sure was nervous and tense and anxious. Oliver's eyes focused on the crystal, and his eyebrows lowered a little. Gregory, I'd... He started to say when somebody shrieked. Oliver, there you are. I've been sending you text after text, and you haven't answered your phone, a woman said, rapidly chomping on her gum. She took a seat next to Oliver and planted a gigantic flavored cappuccino topped with whipped cream down in front of him, next to the small plain coffee I had given him. The coffee wasn't the only thing feeling plain and small. I got you that new birthday cake iced frappuccino with colored sprinkles because I know you'd love it. It's sweet, just like you, the woman said, sitting next to Oliver and intertwining her arm with his. Pat, you know the carbs in that thing go over my daily limit, Oliver said. But you're not training anymore, so it doesn't matter. Besides, I bought it for you, Pat said, her eyes pouting, but she couldn't stop chewing her gum. We weren't alone. At least three tall guys were with us, and they pulled up chairs around us. I recognized them. The woman was on the cheerleading team. The guys were part of the basketball team, and all of them were also in the economics class I shared with Oliver. Guys, this is Gregory from economics, Oliver said, disentangling his arm from Pat's. Gregory, this is Pat, Oliver started to say. Hi, I muttered, folding my arms. I wasn't going to cover the scar this time. We've dated how many times, Oliver? Yet you still call me Pat? It's Patricia. Pat sounds so common, the woman said, and lightly swatted Oliver. She paused, her eyes focusing on my scar, and narrowed. What happened to you? Out of reflex, I covered the scar. I turned away because I didn't want to see the judgment in their eyes. I muttered, dog bite. Patricia gave a plastic smile and said, Gregory, I'm the head cheerleader. You're too little to be a football player and too short to play basketball. And, no offense, you're not built like a swimmer and you don't talk enough to be on debate. You don't look like any of the guys on any of the teams. Are you even on one? He doesn't look like one of those guys in chess club, but maybe one of those build-a-robot science club geeks. Sorry, people, one of the basketball players said. No, I'm not on any team, I said. Pat gave a very long, very weary sigh. Her smile was one adults reserved for little kids. You'll have to excuse us then, Greggy. We have important things to talk about. Oliver, we need to talk about the celebration. I've already bought my dress, and you should see these darling shoes. You will pick me up at 6.30. Patricia, you're interrupting. Gregory and I are talking about the economics paper. When's it due? Oliver said. His tone seemed to sour. A week from Friday, and the professor doesn't want a page count. He wants a word count. 2,500 words, I said, letting my hand drift back to my lap. The three players looked at my left cheek, then focused on something else, but they didn't say anything. 
2,500 words by next Friday, Oliver said, slightly shaking his head. So unfair. Doesn't he realize that we have a life? One of the basketball guys said. I should have dropped the class when I still had a chance, another one of the basketball guys said. Economics? I don't like that class. We don't want to talk about that. Greggy, why don't you run along and let the grown-ups talk? Oliver, you're wearing a tux that night, right? Your tie and cummerbund and that little flower thing and the handkerchief must match my dress, Patricia said, chewing away. But her eyes never left my scar. I made sure I looked at my coffee. Why did I come over? I'm not wearing a tux. I hate suits, and I burned my last tie, Oliver said. Yes, you are wearing a tux, but not a double-breasted one. That reminds me. I have to make an appointment to get my nails done and find a matching purse. So much to do. Greggy, are you still here? Go find someone else to talk about your little paper with, because Oliver and I have things to discuss. Patricia cackled. I sat back a moment, confused, and held my little coffee. This was not going anywhere close to what I had planned. Go on, get moving, Patricia said, and shooed me away. That answers that question, shot down by the girlfriend. This was one crowd I would never fit in. I should have stayed back on my table. See you around, Oliver, guys, I said, standing up. No, we won't, Greggy, Patricia sneered. The guys parted, letting me and my coffee leave. Wait up, Greg. When are we meeting at the library? Oliver called out. Oliver, forget about that stupid paper. You and I have more important things to worry about, Patricia said. Patricia, knock it off, Oliver yelled. Don't talk to me like that, Patricia yelled. I hot-footed it out of there. One thing about introverts, we don't like drama, especially if we can't get away from it. I should have known talking to Oliver was a mistake. Since he had a girlfriend, he definitely wasn't gay. I played with the organite crystal a moment and smiled. At least I had the courage to talk to Oliver. Maybe the crystal was working. I called up Jack and said, I bought Oliver a coffee, talked to him, then his girlfriend showed up. Ouch. Struck out with a foul ball. At least you took a swing, Jack said. They never said anything about the, well, you know, but they looked at it, I said. You need to forget about that and start living, Jack said. I finished my coffee and caught the bus to the strip. Time to get to work. Picture this. Me, the introvert, scared of social scenes, and I'm a floor person at the Bernini Casino, and sometimes I've been a croupier. That's a high-class word for dealer, which means I've run a table, usually eight-deck blackjack, and I ran roulette ones. Tonight, after changing into the uniform, black pants, black vest, white long-sleeved shirt, and a checkered bow tie, the pit boss had me wandering the slots, helping people or answering questions. My most common question, is this slot machine broken? It keeps eating my money. The next day, Thursday morning, I went to economics. I arrived before Oliver and Patricia and the basketball players and took a seat at the back. It was kind of to avoid Oliver and Patricia and all the basketball people. And if the lecture was boring, I could work on the rough draft for the paper. The class was a stepped auditorium, kind of like some movie theaters with the stage, podium, and whiteboard on the lowest point, with a door on each side. By sitting in the back, I had a great view of the entire class, and if I had trouble with the whiteboard, I'd use my phone to zoom in and take a picture. I took out my deck of cards and practiced my shuffling skills. The casino had machines do the shuffling for most of the tables, but I figured it wouldn't hurt to know how to do it. I passed the time with an overhand shuffle, then a rifle to shuffle various types of one-hand splits, and finally the classic move, spreading the cards out in one smooth semicircular motion. The guys who are really good make it look effortless. That's not me. I leave gaps and clumps and it never quite looked right. About two minutes before class started, Oliver and Patricia and the basketball guys entered. Oliver glanced back at my old seat, frowning. Patricia stood next to him, her arms folded. 
They were too far away to hear what they were talking about, but he said something to her, and she pouted. She said something, and I think Oliver rolled his eyes. That was when he saw me. Oliver said something to the others, and left them. Patricia gave some kind of a scowl and walked back to the guys. Oliver climbed the stairs to the back, to the row I sat in, and, Oliver, I'm saving a seat for you, Patricia sweetly yelled over the noise of the incoming class. It's right next to me. This time, Oliver definitely rolled his eyes. He took a seat to my left and gave me a smile that showed off his dimples. After one look at my cards, he said, You any good? Getting there. Sometimes I'm a dealer at the casino I work at, I said. Which casino? Oliver asked. Bernini, the one with all the statues, I said. I know that one. You working Saturday? he asked. I wasn't, but my boss called me to work overtime. Some big event has booked the banquet hall so everyone has to work. So, sorry, I can't go on a date with you that night, I said. The words flying past my filter before I realized what had come out of my mouth. Oliver's eyebrows raised, and he tilted his head a little. I had committed a serious faux pas. The heat fluttered across my face. Did I really ask Oliver out? He was seeing Patricia, the head cheerleader. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that, and I don't know why I did. Pretend I didn't say it, I muttered. Oliver kind of chuckled. Blame the college for your overtime. That's the annual celebration dinner for all the teams, Oliver said. I never said thank you for the coffee, and it was good coffee, just the way I like it. It wasn't fancy, I mumbled, thankful for the change of subject. I don't like fancy coffees. Too many carbs and too much sugar. Training for basketball has gotten me to eat clean, and I like eating that way, Oliver said. Then why did Patricia get you that huge thing? I asked. I don't know. I tried to sip, but it was too sweet for me. I think she's afraid she's going to lose me, Oliver said. And I just lost Oliver. He just confirmed that he was straight. There go my chances. I kept my face composed to hide my disappointment and said, Why does she think she's losing you? Long story. Why are you back here? Oliver asked. To keep things from being awkward, I said. Why would someone as handsome as you hide in the shadows? Oliver asked. My left hand immediately covered the scars and my eyes teared. The kids had called me Scarface and Scarboy and Scary Boy and Ugly and Crater Face and a million other things. I'd been tripped, my books knocked out of my hands, something disgusting smeared on my locker's lock almost daily, and my locker was vandalized and covered with graffiti. When it didn't stop, I transferred schools. It's okay, Oliver said, and took my left hand and held it. What happened? I was about eleven. We went to visit my Aunt Steph and Uncle Edmund for a family picnic. They own the coolest place back east. It's in the middle of a forest, and it's a wolf preserve. Anyway, my cousins Jack and Wesley and I were goofing off, and Wesley wanted to show me the new wolf pup. Jack and Wesley went behind the house, and a few minutes later, Jack let out this big black wolf pup. We were playing around, and I guess it was still wild because the pup bit me. The bite was too deep for the emergency room superglue, so I had to get stitches. They gave me a rabies shot and a tetanus shot and an antibiotic shot to be safe. My aunt made some natural tea that tasted weird, and she made me drink it every day for a week. She's into holistic stuff like that. What happened to the wolf? Oliver asked. I never saw it again, but Aunt Steph said it's on the preserve somewhere. You should have heard my uncle yell at Wesley and Jack. Aunt Steph said I was lucky, I said. What did she mean? Oliver said. I didn't get rabies or sick, and the bite didn't get infected, I said. Their scars are nothing to be ashamed of. It only gives you an interesting story. Instead of sitting here alone, come join us. The guys are cool, and I told Pat she'd been rude to one of my friends, so she better apologize, Oliver said. Besides, I need help with the paper. Aren't you and Patricia an item? I asked. I've been thinking about that. Oliver said. The professor entered the classroom and set his briefcase on the desk, opened the briefcase, and placed his notes on the podium. Come on, Oliver said. Before I knew it, Oliver grabbed my hand and pulled me to my feet. I quickly put the cards away, and he led me to the row they were sitting at. Guys, you remember my friend Gregory, Oliver said. Hi, I said. 
The guys moved over a couple of seats, making room for me and Oliver. I sat down. Oliver sat next to me on my left side, and Pat took the chair next to Oliver. Patricia, Oliver said, you have something to say? She sighed. Oliver, I don't see what the big deal is, or why I have to apologize. We had to talk, and besides, Greggy's not on any team, so he wouldn't understand. Patricia, Oliver said again. He won't. Look at him. He probably never gets invited to upscale parties like this, and he wouldn't fit in, Patricia said. My left hand covered my cheek. Look, I'm doing Greggy a favor, Patricia said, carefully adjusting her makeup. Oliver took my left hand and held it. That's right, I wanted to say. I don't get invited to parties. I kept my mouth shut to keep the peace. Why don't you talk to Gregory about it, Patty, one of the basketball guys said. Patricia humped, pulled out a lipstick and applied it to her lips. Fine, I'm sorry, Gregory, but only a small percentage of the student body is on a team. We're the school's royalty, and this is a party for royalty, and you're not part of it. Besides, it's the last time the teams will be together, and it's our last one because we're seniors. So you understand, right? Get this, guys. I heard Coach Sorensen was retiring. That's old news, Oliver said. An apology and a smackdown all in one. I should be used to it, but I wasn't. I kept my face pleasant. Our professor tapped the podium, and the class became quiet. Had I said a single word since Oliver had brought me here? It had all been about the tension between Patricia and Oliver. Somehow, I'd gotten involved in the team's drama. I should have stayed in the back. Being around so many people and so much drama was draining. Still, Oliver never let go of my hand. Patricia took hold of Oliver's left hand, but he shook it free. I'm trying to write. I ignored them and focused on the professor. A lot of what he presented was new. But towards the end, he digressed and spoke about the research paper. Patricia kept looking at me, at my scar, her sculpted eyebrows furrowed. Rather than listen to the professor, she nestled her phone in her lap and was quietly texting. About halfway through the lecture, I think Patricia took a picture of me and then kept on texting. If the professor noticed her lack of involvement, he didn't say anything. Once class was over, the others left, except Patricia. She took hold of Oliver's arm and rambled on about her new dress for the upcoming celebration. She even had pictures. Somebody called her on her phone, and she stepped away from us for a moment. You didn't say anything earlier when Patricia or my friends were around, Oliver asked. What do I say to him? We're so different. I take a long time to open up to people, I said. Shy? Oliver asked. Kind of. I'm not like you and your friends, I said. What do you mean? I wish I could be more like you. Outgoing and popular, able to jump into conversations, not afraid to get to know someone. But it's hard. It's almost like a physical pain getting to know a new person. But when I do, I said, staring off at nothing. I had to take psychology too. Instead of a hundred casual friendships that last weeks or months, you have a handful of very close friends that will last a lifetime, Oliver said. It's like a family, I said. And you wanted to see if I would fit into that family, Oliver asked. I played with the orgone crystal about my neck and finally said, I'm gay and I like you. I kind of figured that out, Oliver said. You should see the way my aunt and uncle love each other, or my cousin Jack with his lady, Miranda. My folks didn't have that specialness. Maybe that's why my dad left us. I guess I'm looking for my someone special, I said. Then yesterday, Patricia bulldozed your chance to talk to me, Oliver said. I should have guessed you were straight and already had someone, I said. I've never had a relationship last more than a few months. I've never found someone I wanted to stay with, Oliver said. It sounds like you're trying to avoid something, maybe a long-term commitment, I said. Only a psych major would say that, but I wouldn't mind slowing down for a little while, Oliver said. Do you have time right now to work on the paper? 
Patricia walked towards us and sneered. Listen to Captain Lamo. You are seriously going to the library right now, rather than take me out for a late lunch? I can't believe I'm even dating you. I'm going to the mall with my friends. What about your paper? Oliver asked. The paper is already done, Patricia said. How? I asked. I have a life and I know people, Patricia said, and walked out. What's that mean? I asked Oliver. He shrugged. You have to understand, Patricia. She probably got someone to write it for her. Once we got to the library, Oliver and I talked about the paper, about basketball, about life. We just talked about anything. The alarm on my phone rang. I've got to get to work, I said. Tomorrow morning, here, before class, my turn to bring coffee, Oliver asked. I nodded. On my way to work, I texted Jack. The foul ball didn't count. I'm up to bat again. After I arrived at the Bernini and changed, I was on my feet, all shift. Usually we get a break, but for some reason the tourists had flocked to Vegas early. The pit boss called me over to run one of the tables, eight-deck blackjack. Friday morning, I woke before my alarm. I was actually excited. Me and Oliver were studying together. He was buying me coffee. It was a date, sort of. We met at the library about an hour before class, but we weren't alone. His three friends came along. Hi, I softly said. They need help too, Oliver said. Where's Patricia? I asked. About time Oliver got rid of that ball and chain, one of the friends said. She won't be joining us today, Oliver said. Oliver brought me a large plain coffee, just like the one he had. I pretended not to notice the odd smiles and knowing looks his friends passed between them. We wrote and looked at books and talked, and something weird happened. These guys were some of the most popular people on campus, and they accepted me. For an hour, I hung out with them. They would never know what this meant to me. They couldn't understand how hard it was for me to relax around people. But for an hour, I opened up a tiny bit. Saturday, I wore both the rainbow crystal and the obsidian necklace Aunt Steph had made for me. Big crowds stressed me out. I had to report to Bernini's by four to help set up the banquet hall. With all the people expected, Bernini's needed everyone. It took us two hours to get the tables and chairs set up in the banquet hall, get an area set up for the caterers, get the portable stage set up, set up the podium and adjust the spotlights, lower the screen behind the stage, reconfigure the sound system, rearrange everything so there was a dance floor, and hang the university logo to the side of the portable stage. They wanted a couple of tables for trophies and awards and special seating for the president of the college and the dean of athletics and their families. If the casino hadn't had its own army of workers, the job would never have gotten done. All that, in addition to all the work we normally had to do. It also meant that every poker, blackjack, roulette, and craps table needed to be manned. They assigned me to a blackjack table near the slot machines. A little before seven, all the guests filtered in. It must be the athletic department version of prom night, except it was bring your families. The guys wore tuxes and the girls wore evening gowns. Patricia had been right. This event was for royalty. In an odd way, I wanted to be like the people in the banquet hall. No scars, no fear, and comfortable in my own skin. I didn't have a chance to look for Oliver. A lot of people decided to get a little action at the tables before the ceremony started, and kept gambling even after it started. I had three people on my table, one man and two women. I dealt two cards face up to each person, and then one card face up and one card face down for the house. The face up card was a ten of spades. One of the women had a pair of sixes, and she placed a second equal bet next to the first and said split. I divided the sixes and placed a new card on each, a seven and another six. She tapped the table and I added two new cards, a jack and a king. She gave a soft chuckle and shook her head. She'd lost in both stacks. I cleaned up her cards and bet and moved to the next person. The other woman had a jack of clubs and a three. 
She gestured and said, Hit me. I dealt her a five and a two. She stood on twenty. The man shook his head. He had a pair of twos. He looked at me, looked at his cards, and placed a second bet. Split. I split the cards, added a second card to each stack. The first stack received a queen, and the second stack received a second two. The man placed a third bet, and split again. He finally stood with a nineteen and two eighteens. I flipped the second of my cards over. An ace. I had a natural blackjack. Sorry about this, but the house wins. The man and woman groaned. I gathered the cards and the bets and said, Place your bets. Once everybody had bet, I dealt a new round. Something happened by the door to the banquet hall. Three people came out and spoke to one of the floor managers. I tuned out what was going on around me and played cards. We played a hand. This time, the house lost. What's the game? A new woman said. It was Patricia, and she's already drunk? I smiled and politely said, Eight deck blackjack, standard rules, minimum bet five dollars, maximum bet one thousand dollars. That's cheap. Just like you. Deal is in, Greggy. Patricia sneered. She had two friends with her, and they were dressed for the night. Patricia wore a tight-fitting, low-cut, high-slit, turquoise thing with crossed straps in the back. One friend wore a strapless pink sequined thing, and the other wore a red long-sleeved, kind of a double-skirted thing. Patricia wasn't that far from me, but I could still smell her alcohol breath. The three people already at my table moved over to make room. As soon as everyone was settled, I said, Place your bets. Girls, can you believe that Oliver dumped me so he could date this man? Patricia sneered and pointed at me. You got dumped for a man? The woman in the red dress said. Inwardly, I was embarrassed. Outwardly, I remained calm. I resisted the urge to cover my cheek. Took a breath instead. That scrawny toothpick? First thing tomorrow you need to lay off the mashed potatoes and french fries. Get your sexy curves back, the girl in pink said. Are you saying I'm fat? Patricia slurred. She's saying the junk in your trunk isn't staying in your trunk, the friend in the red dress said. Place your bets, please, I said, trying to remain professional. Either you three ante up or move on, the man sitting at the table said. Greggy, you're the only person Oliver noticed these days. What's so special about you? Patricia said. She and her friends still hadn't placed their bets, and until they did, I couldn't deal the first round. The man's dealing the cards. Leave him alone and play the game, the man at the table snarled. There's nothing special about me, Patricia. Oliver and I haven't dated or anything. Place your bets, please, I repeated. Finally, Patricia set a couple of chips down. Her friends followed suit. I began dealing two face-up cards to each person. Patricia didn't even look at her cards, but turned to her friend in pink and drunkenly whined. Get this, Oliver and I were dating for several months, and he came over to my apartment the other night. We go for a walk, and he dumped me. Oliver told me we didn't connect anymore. Then told me that he met somebody. And Greggy, you're the only person he's met recently. You've stolen my boyfriend. I know the signs. I don't know what you're talking about, ma'am. I only bought him a coffee and we worked on our paper, I said. Tell Oliver he's not as sexy as the captain of the soccer team. Neither are you, Patricia yelled and slammed the table. She slid her arms across the green felt, sending cards and chips sliding everywhere. My cards, those were good ones, the man said. I pushed the hidden panic button. Then I drooped my head a little so my hair covered the scars. This was just like middle school. That's telling him, the friend in the red dress said, also standing. Ma'am, you've had too much to drink. Please control yourself. I suggest you and your friends leave. We'll restart the round, I said, gathering the cards and restoring the bets. I suggest you and your friends leave, the girl in the pink dress mimicked me in a cartoon chirpy voice. At least I have friends, Patricia smirked. Good lord, ladies, stop flapping those jaws. Some of us are here to play cards, one of the women at the table yelled. Once the table was cleaned up, I turned to the regular players and said, I apologize for the interruptions. Place your bets and we'll restart. Once again, Patricia and her friends didn't move. 
Patricia, you and your friends need to leave now, I said. Patricia stood up and screamed. This game is stupid. You're stupid. The pit boss came over, his hand covering the microphone of his headset. Is there a problem? The lady was dumped and has had too much to drink. She's disturbed the cards, the bets, and the table, I said. Security to table 17. Ma'am, I think you should leave, the pit boss said. I'm not leaving. I'm head cheerleader, and it's my night to celebrate. Do you hear me? It's my night. I'm royalty. Oliver needs sexy me, and not you, Scarface, Patricia slurred. It still stung. Even after all these years, my left hand immediately covered the scars. The girl in pink gave an embarrassed smile as security gathered behind her. She grabbed Patricia's elbow and tugged. Come on, you're going to get us kicked out. They can't kick me out. I'm the head cheerleader. This is my party, Patricia slurred. Yes, they can, a man said, walking up behind them. Oliver. Crisp and stylish, the tux fitted him like it had been made for him. For your information, Gregory is much sexier than you, and smarter, and is someone I want to get to know, starting tonight. What are you doing after work, Gregory? Patricia screamed. Oliver, you like him better than me? I do, Oliver said, giving me a slight nod and a sexy half smile. I never even liked you. Come on, girls, Patricia screamed. Return to the banquet hall and we will consider this a warning. Next time, you will be forcibly evicted and we will charge the three of you with disorderly conduct, the pit boss said. The girl in pink stepped away from Patricia. Fine, Patricia muttered as her friends marched her to the banquet hall. The woman in the red dress slightly turned toward me and Oliver and mouthed, Sorry. I took a deep breath and ran my fingers through my hair. Was my hand shaking? I don't handle drama well. Don't you listen to that witch, the woman that had the split earlier said. If I was twenty years younger, I'd give your cute boyfriend a run for his money. Maybe I still could. The pit boss watched as security escorted Patricia and her friends back to the banquet hall. Then he went to another table. I'm glad that's over. Ma'am, you are right. Gregory is sexy and beautiful, but he's taken if he'll have me. Oliver sat down at my table with a basket full of chips. Oliver, I asked, I thought you were straight. I don't believe in labels, Oliver said and smiled at me. What time do you get off work? In about an hour, I said. Then how about you be my plus one and we enjoy dinner, Oliver said. I'll accept your offer and raise you some dancing, I said, glancing at Oliver. How can I top that? Will you take a kiss as collateral, Oliver said, climbing out of his seat and walking around the table. Um, I said, smiling. My face warmed up. Oliver held my left cheek and gently rubbed the scars with his thumb. You are incredibly sexy when you blush, he whispered. And you've had too much to drink, I said. But Oliver placed a finger over my lips to quiet me. Haven't touched a drop, but I will if you share a drink with me, Oliver said. Save the romance for later. Deal the cards already, the man at the table growled. Oliver and I shared a kiss, and then a smile. And then I said... Place your bets. The end. Thank you for sharing the story with me. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed, please remember to like and subscribe. Thanks. Peace.